Good morning. Good morning. Wow, everybody's here. Uh, let's stand and sing our opening chorus. Heavenly Father, thank you that we can come here once again, Lord, to learn more about you and sing praises to you um, and help us to be a light in your world. We hope the message that we hear uh, will bring nothing but praise, honor, and glory to your name. It's in your name we pray. Amen. All right. Uh, remain standing and say hello to someone.
our next hymn, Victory in Jesus.
Okay, our prayer requests. Uh, Bob Meehan, uh, ongoing health issues, and he's here today. Um, uh, Danelle Ancelucci um, works with Kevin, has breast cancer, uh, and she's reviewing her options. Uh, Sally Geary, a PET scan this week, uh, more testing that is needed. She is also here with us. Uh, Aaron Fredericks, uh, Julie Briggs's friend, um, had hysterectomy uh, for uterine cancer, um, starting chemo. Uh, Colleen Scott, friend of Marilyn, um, she had a heart attack. Yeah. Bill Jones, uh, Bryce's supervisor, has prostate cancer, uh, very sore and tired, a long recovery ahead, expected to be out for eight weeks. Uh, Whitey Mahenry, a friend of Chrissy, broken ribs and pneumonia. Um, an unspoken prayer request. Uh, Sharon M, massive stroke and in ICU. Uh, Donna McBee uh, works with Carrie, tripped and fell, broke three bones and dislocated elbow. Surgery was scheduled for Tuesday this past week. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, Jackie Shearer uh, fell at work, broke bones in her right arm, and sprained her, le uh, sprained her left, also had a concussion June 1st. Uh, Mary Blakely has a punctured bladder, possible surgery. Um, one extra one that was given to me is a Debbie Byselt, Sandy's former roommate at the nursing home. Um, is in critical care with pneumonia. All right. All right, we will take these to the Lord in prayer. Uh, dear Father, thank you that we can uh, take everything to you in prayer, and we know, Lord, that you are the great physician, and you take care of um, each request according to your will. Uh, Lord, again, we see that word cancer, um, and we just pray that you give some doctor the knowledge uh, to put an end to this dreaded disease. Uh, we also have people that are waiting for tests, Lord, and we know that waiting for the results of these tests um, can be very difficult. So we just ask you that uh, you give those waiting for uh, the test the peace that transcends all understanding. Uh, we love you, Lord, and thank you for loving us. It's in your name we pray, amen. All right. Our communion hymn. The Old Rugged Cross.
Good morning. morning. That was the perfect communion song, the great sacrifice that Jesus made for us. And this morning, before I do our reading, which is one you've heard many times in 1 Corinthians, I want to talk about what communion's all about. This is an honor to come before this table to commune with our Lord and our Savior. And we're called to do three things during this time period. Number one is remember. Jesus in these scriptures tells us twice to remember him, to remember what he did, remember his ministry, remember the great, great sacrifice that he made for us, to never let that out of our minds, to always remember what Jesus did. That's why he instituted the communion, communion message. Second thing is for the future. He tells us that it's a new covenant a new promise that he's made to us. And because of that promise, we look forward to him until he comes again to take us to be with him. And he ends with that. And he also says that, again, this new blood, this new covenant, it's our, the final defeat of Satan. So that's when the Satan will be completely defeated and Jesus will take us to be with him. So we remember, we also look forward And then the final thing that Paul writes is the present. What about now? We're to examine ourselves, examine our relationship with Christ, examine what we feel with Jesus about our prayer life, about what we're doing in our lives, and ask for forgiveness for our when we come up short. But we're to examine ourselves at the same time that we're doing this. And so it's about remembering It's about the future, and it's about the present, what we're doing now with Christ. I would like to read from 1 Corinthians, the 11th chapter, starting with verse 13. For I have received from the Lord what I have passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat the bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again. Therefore, whoever eats the bread and drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner, will be guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. A man ought to examine himself before he eats of the bread and drinks of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without recognizing the body of the Lord eats and drinks judgment upon himself. Lord, together. Our dear loving Heavenly Father, truly we are very grateful to being able to have this time to gather around the communion table, being able to commune with you. Father, we just are so thankful of the love that you've had for us to provide a way that we can spend eternity with you and that we can have forgiveness for our sins. We thank you for Jesus and for all of he has done to have gone to that cross, taking our sins upon himself. Father, it's just so mind-boggling to us how someone could die for people such as us. But Father, we're very grateful And we're thankful. Father, we pray that you would guide us now as we partake of these emblems, helping us being able to remember the time that Jesus gave his life, that he shed his blood so that, Father, we can have forgiveness for our sin and being able to spend eternity with you. Forgive us, Father, for all the times we fail and fall short. Be with those who are about to partake, helping them to being able to remember Jesus. And, Father, we so look forward to the time that when our lives here on earth are done, because of what Jesus has done, that we can spend eternity with you. And Father, we just so look forward to that day. Father, guide and direct us. Forgive us for all the times that we fail and fall short. And we just thank you for allowing us, letting us have this time to be together and to commune with you. Father, we love you. We praise you. And we thank you once again for all your blessings. We do thank you so much for Jesus. It's in his name we ask all these things. Amen.
before Jesus was betrayed, he took the bread. In the same manner, after the supper, he took the cup with the fruit of the vine. Brother John up. Good morning. Descriptions are such a big part of who we are in society. Names, words, and such. We, we take names and we identify with names. How many of you like being called mom? Yeah. Or dad? Yeah. Grandma or grandpa? Sure. Why wouldn't we? Some of us have been called other names too, uh, more flattering. Some people, nerds, because you like comic book movies, you know, or, or uh, a fan because of a particular sport that you like or a team that you like. And that's not a bad thing. Some have been called pharaoh equinologists. Do we have any pharaoh equinologists here? Anyone who knows what that is? Someone who likes trains. Anybody like trains? You're a pharaoh equinologist. Okay. Some names we identify with, some we don't identify with, but there's more than just one facet to who we are. Some of us are avid moviegoers. Some of us are huge sports fans. Some of us love working outside in the dirt with flowers and groundskeeping. Some, some of us have all sorts of different interests that describe who we are. When we meet somebody for the very first time, what's one of the questions that we ask each other? What is it that you do... For a living, right? And what are some of the responses that we give them? What responses do you give? You can say it out loud. What, what do you do for a living? Nothing. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if you want that as your label. How many school teachers have we had? Okay, what other vocations have you had? Or do you currently have? What's that? Nurse aid. Nurse's aid? Shop. Does that there, there you go. Crane operator, Crane operator. sure. 
What cashier? What did you say? A registered nut. Yeah, that's, there we go. There we go. A nanny. A nanny, yeah. Very good. <laughs> some names, I guess, some names also could be a little bit on the dicey side, right? So it is with Jesus. There are so many descriptions of who Jesus is in the Bible. We could go on and on and on. We could do a, a series just alone on the names that he's given in connection with his birth record. But throughout the scriptures, there are so many descriptions of who Jesus is. On one particular occasion, we see what we're going to uh, describe about him today. But in context, we go to John chapter 8, verses 42, and we're going to go all the way here uh, to the very end of the chapter. We're covering two sections with subtitles. I don't care about subtitles. I, I, I don't know if you do, but... They help us understand as we're skimming and trying to find something, but Jesus was having a bit of a uh, back and forth with the legalists of his day. They were ones who were happy to be children of, of Abraham, but at the same time, they sure didn't seem to be living according to the promise. They were people who considered themselves Jews, but they were not people of God. Jesus said to them, if God were your father, you would love me. For I came from God and now am here. I've not only come on my own, but he sent me. Why is my language not clear to you? He says, because you're unable to hear what I say. Why would they be unable to hear what Jesus said? It's kind of hard to hear like this. Say something right now. Say something loudly. I heard noises, but I could not tell what you were saying. Because I had them jammed in there pretty good. Oh, good, I didn't pull anything out. When you choose not to listen, it's amazing how effective you are at not listening, right? When we look at this, there's this back and forth. And names and descriptions are about to be had. Jesus says in verse 44, something very unflattering of the legalists of his day. He says, you belong to your father, the devil, and he wants to carry out, or you want to carry out your father's desire. He was a murderer from the beginning, not holding to the truth, for there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks his native language, for he is a liar and the father of lies. Jesus just launches a name-calling assault, realistically, on the Pharisees of his day. The teachers of the law were not about the things of God. They were about themselves. They were selfish. They had their own selfish desires. They wanted to be the ones in authority in their own lives. And they wanted to do what got them attention. And they wanted to do what brought them money. And they wanted to do what got them the praise and the position afforded to them by the masses. They even were willing to spread slander about Jesus. And they were about to call names too. 
Boy, we don't really like name calling though, do we? So it's a little bit surprising that Jesus just comes right out and says all this negativity and throws it out. It seems very un-Jesus like, right? But Jesus has a chance to call out the evil attitudes in them. He has this opportunity right here as he faces them down. And it's less of a slanderous accusation and it's more of a realistic description because they never had in mind the things of God. Even while he's having this conversation, they're having murderous thoughts about how to end Jesus and his influence. It's not slander. It's not name-calling. It's who they were. It's a sad commentary. And it's pretty, pretty harsh. But it's true. They've already been attacking him. And this is his response. He says... I'm telling you the truth. He says in verse 45, because I tell you the truth, you don't believe me. He says, can any of you prove me guilty of sin? But they always accused him of sin. Isn't it interesting how the ones who are usually guilty of doing a sin are so quick to see that sin in others? Hmm. He says, if I'm telling you the truth, if I'm telling the truth, why don't you believe me? He who belongs to God hears what God says. I'm going to repeat that. He who belongs to God hears what God says. But who's speaking right now? Is it the Father or the Son? So, we're seeing a pattern here. Who is Jesus? He who belongs to God hears what who? God says. Jesus is God. The reason you do not hear what The reason that you do not hear is that you do not belong to God, he tells the legalistic people. They answered him, aren't we right in saying that you're a Samaritan and (laughs) demon-possessed? Okay, now how could they think that he was a Samaritan? Let's First of all, let's take care of that matter right there. Why would they think that he was a Samaritan? Any Sunday school teachers putting two and two together? What town do they consider him from? Not the birthplace, but the other place. Jesus of Nazareth. That's up. If you're dividing the kingdoms, the kingdom of Israel territory, which also exiled, and then there was intermarriage, And that became the area of Samaria. So Jesus of Nazareth came from the area that was very Samaritan-based, demographically speaking. But where was Jesus from? Where was he born, first of all? Bethlehem. Bethlehem. Okay. So we go back to Bethlehem. They escaped and went to Egypt. And then they went to Nazareth. So he's not a Samaritan. A Samaritan was someone who was from another kingdom, ancestry-wise, whose parents had intermarried with someone who was Jewish. So if you took mom and dad, one of them was from another area, and had intermarried with someone who was Jewish, you have a Samaritan. 
especially in the area of Samaria. Was Mary non-Jewish or Jewish? Jewish. Okay. Joseph, from a legal perspective, was he Jewish or non-Jewish? So he wasn't a Samaritan, was he? But they wanted to actually label him like that so that the masses would look at him in a very negative light. They were, in fact, being racist at that time. And slanderous, too, because they were saying that he was what? Not only a Samaritan. What's it say in chapter 8, verse 48? Samaritan and demon-possessed. Yeah. They literally were calling him as vile of things that they could. You know, sometimes labels are very, very good. They're good descriptions of who we are. And sometimes labels just aren't accurate. They're a desperate attempt to smear someone. Hopefully you're not smearing anybody. Hopefully you're not getting smeared either. But many times people get accused of stuff. Right here, they're calling Jesus a Samaritan. And I threw out the racist term earlier, just a moment ago. Did you know I've actually been called a racist before? I have been. I was called a racist, sexist, homophobe. Did you know that? Kevin's back there thinking, oh man, I can't believe we hired this guy. <laughs> no, it's true. And do you know what my offense was? This is, this is a terrible thing that I did. I didn't like the eighth Star Wars movie. And I literally had a former friend call me racist, sexist, and a homophobe because I thought that there should have been better character development and plot development. Some labels stick, and some are desperate attempts to smear you. Some labels are accurate, and some are just stupid. Not only was Jesus not a Samaritan, he definitely was not demon-possessed. There are some descriptions of Jesus that are very accurate. But there are also ones that not only are they not accurate, man, it's a desperate attempt to call him that. He said, I'm not possessed by a demon, but I honor my father as you dishonor me. I'm not seeking glory for myself, but there is one who seeks it, and he is a judge. I tell you the truth, if anyone keeps my word, he will never see death. At this, the Jews exclaimed, now we know that you are demon-possessed. See, he's making very bold claims about being God. He calls God the judge, and he says, if anyone keeps my word, he'll never die. But the problem was, they're thinking that physically they're never going to die. Who's the one who controls that? Physical death. Who controls that? God, God holds life and death in his hands. And at the same time, they're not understanding that he is talking on a whole different level. Because he's talking about on an eternal level. And they're ready, they're ready to stone him. 
They said, Abraham died, and so did the prophets. Yet you say, if anyone keeps your word, he will never taste death. Are you greater than our father Abraham? He died, and so did the prophets. Who do you think you are? He goes on and he talks about you know, him trying to glorify himself. He says, I'm not trying to glorify myself. He says, my father, whom you claim is your God, is the one who's glorifying me. And that gets us into an interesting topic, doesn't it? You know, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. They're one, but they're also distinct. And so I can't wrap my head around that. That's, that's just a little bit difficult to understand if any of you are struggling with understanding it, guess what? You're not alone. I'm right here preaching. And this is something I have a very difficult time wrapping my head around. How can you have three in one? When Jesus was praying in the garden, if Jesus is God, who was he praying to? And if Jesus is here, where's the Father? How can that be? You see, God is not confined in any way, shape, or form on the same things that we think that confine us. Time, he's not confined by time. Space, he's not confined by space. Knowledge, he's not confined by knowledge. Power, he's not confined by power. Those are our limits, but God lives outside of that. And it's only because Jesus actually came and submitted to our confinements that we even know that Jesus existed. <clears throat> Blows my mind. But make no mistake, God the Father, as we know when Jesus was baptized, was proud of Jesus. Jesus, when he took the sins upon him on the cross, cried out, why have you forsaken me to the Father? Because there is one, but there is three, too. Jesus is God, but somehow there's a distinct Father who is still a part of him as one, too. But there's not three gods, there's one. I can't understand it, and I don't think I will until I get to their side of glory. And if you don't understand it, you're in good company. It's okay to, to take things by faith without being able to understand some facets of the faith. But when Jesus is talking here with them, they ask him, who do you think you are? And if you look at verse 58, he says, I tell you the truth, before Abraham was born, what? I am. What's that a reference to? When Moses was up on Sinai and God had called him to rescue the Israelites, and he asked God, if they ask who sent me, when he asks God, he says, God, when they ask me who sent me, what do I tell them, God? And God said, Tell them I am sent you. All of the miracles, all of the history of Israel, as they were rescued and redeemed out of Egypt, as they were sent on to the promised land, miracle after miracle after miracle after miracle after miracle was done by the Lord God. I am whom Jesus just claimed himself to be. At that point, they picked up the stones. At that point, they were ready to stone him. But Jesus slipped away. Jesus is God. Let's look at other scriptures here. 
we see once again, he is, I am. In Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3, the writer says, he is the radiance of the glory of God. So when you think about God, when you picture, if you can fathom picturing God in your mind, in all of reality, he is the radiance of God's glory. He is, look at this, the exact imprint of his nature. Some of your translations have the representation, which is a good translation too, except that a representative doesn't always well represent his constituents. Jesus did represent well. He was the imprint of his nature. He was God in the flesh. And he upholds the universe by what? The word of his power. Who upholds the universe? It's referring to Jesus. Speaking of word, John 1, verse 1. In the beginning was what? The word. Of all descriptions, of all words fitted, ascribed to Jesus, was the word. We'll unpack this in the future too at some point. But the communication of God. When we go through Genesis, we started to go through Genesis this morning in, in Jim's Sunday school class. God spoke. And there was light. In the beginning was the word. John describes Jesus as literally that which comes from God himself, the essence of the creative being. And that word was what? Okay, so Jesus was with God, right? What else? The word was God. If we go a little bit further down to 114, just in case you're thinking, maybe John's referring to someone else or talking on a different level. Look at this. John also says here, the word what? Became flesh and made his dwelling among us. So Jesus literally was God who put on skin, who put on flesh. He was now bone and muscle and tissue and blood. He accepted that. And he made that dwelling among us. The word there for dwelling is often used for tents. Who likes camping? Who likes camping in a tent? Okay. Props, I didn't see many hands go down. Some of you like camping, but you like camping in, in, in other homes. We call them like cabins and such, you know. They've got kitchens and bathroom and really soft bathroom TP and stuff like that. But you know what? What's that? Glamping. Yes, thank you, Sam. Some of you are very glam. You're, you're glamping all the time when you're camping. No shade. I kind of prefer that myself. Last 10 I had had about three inches of water in after rainstorm. It did not help me. God put on flesh in the form of Jesus and lived in this world. He made his dwelling almost like tent camping among us. So much more I could unpack on that, but I'm going to have to wait. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. And there we have another verse that shows us some indication. God and the Father are one. Because the word became flesh, 
He made his dwelling among us. So God came and put on skin, but yet he came from the Father. There's two in one. We know there's three in one. But that's why Paul said in Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 7, your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus, who being in the very nature God, his nature is God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped. So think about this. A lot of people grasp for power, position. They want to climb up in life, not go down. Jesus, in his very nature, was God. And he decided, you know what, I'm not going to cling to that. But he made himself what? Nothing. Right there. And he took on the very nature of a servant. Being made in human likeness. Jesus, our God, went to all extents of humiliation and being lowered as far as possible so that he could be with us. From the most successful in this life compared to the highest heights of the glory of God, that that highest, most successful is nothing. The most obedient and righteous are nothing compared to the holiness of God. But that you have the depths of the lowest of human condition the impoverished, the addictions, the brokenheartedness, the lowest depths that we can go, God understands. And he sees you. Whatever your hurt, whatever your pain, whatever your despair, whatever your worry, he sees you. He understands. And we see here in Colossians chapter 2, verse 9, for in Christ all the fullness of the deity lives in what? He really came. And when he came, he was still fully God. He is Jesus. Peter says this in testimony to him. As he's getting ready to write Second Peter, he's writing to, to uh, just a generic set of people, whoever receives it, whatever letters got passed around, he's writing to Christians. He says, to those who through the righteousness of, how does he describe Jesus here? Our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now some may be thinking, okay, that could be two people. To those who through righteousness of our God and Savior Jesus Christ. No, that is actually a description of Jesus. Grammatically, in the Greek, that both describes Jesus Christ. Jesus is God. In John chapter 10, verses uh, 30 through 33, he says... I and the Father are what? One. God the Father, God the Son, and by the way, God the Holy Spirit, one God. And the, the portion of God that somehow is also fully God that we know is Jesus He knows what it's like to be where you're at. He knows right now as your advocate. And again, just like we started with, the Jews picked up stones to stone him. And Jesus said to them, I've shown you many great miracles from the Father. For which of these do you stone me? And they said, we're not stoning you for any of these, replied the Jews, but for blasphemy, because you, a mere man, claim to be God. Was Jesus a mere man? How many of you 
mere men and women can walk on water. Not bottles of water in a case. Don't, don't nerd out on me here. I'm making a real point. How many of you can literally walk on a lake? Not stones that are right close to the surface, but a lake. How many of you can cure blindness in someone else without medical care? How many of you can cure a paraplegic? How many of us can raise someone from the dead? How many of us can multiply food so that everybody that we see that we're able to actually care for can be fed? Not thousands. All of these things happened with many, many people around. There was no dispute. There were witnesses. And there were many witnesses when he himself rose from the dead. Unfortunately, none of us have witnessed anything like that either. He is no mere man. They just didn't want to listen. You see, when you admit that Jesus is who he says he is, you have to yield to the fact that he is God and also that you are not. You're not in control. You're not in charge of your life. You don't determine what's right and wrong. You don't determine what's good and what's evil in your life. What you do when you like to do stuff, but God says it's sin, if you admit there's no God, if you say, I don't think there's a God then it means you're free to do that stuff, right? Sam, could, could, could I use you for a moment here? Just respond to me, okay? I want you to say, I don't believe that John Reed exists. I don't believe that John exists. I'm still here! <laughs> Even if you don't believe that God exists, that, that doesn't mean that he doesn't exist. Right? I'm still here. If you don't believe that Jesus is the Lord, the God of the universe, who came and died for our sins, who rose by his own power, so that he someday will be the one to whom everyone kneels and their tongue confesses that he is Lord, that he is God, If you don't kneel and don't confess now, you will one day because not believing and just throwing a fit, a temper tantrum, because you want to do your own thing or you didn't get an answer prayer the way that you wanted to, even if it was a very serious issue. Your lack of belief does not cause someone to cease to exist. I'm still here. But he will be here long after I am. He is the Lord. He is God. So we have two options. Will you accept him or will you reject him? Which will you choose? I say that to a bunch of people who are at church here now, and I don't know if any have not yet accepted him as their personal Lord and Savior. We also have folks that may be watching online or checking us out. You may not understand whether, whether you need to accept him or reject him, uh, which way you're going to go, but I'm telling you, 
there's a simple response to accepting him. The Bible says to believe in him. To confess your faith. To repent of your sins. He'll help you too, by the way. And you'll get that help when you are baptized or immersed, as what the word means, in him for the forgiveness of your sins and the gift of the Holy Spirit. That gift of the Holy Spirit helps you in your repentance ongoingly for the rest of your days. And then you continue to follow him. Why? Because when you accept him, right here, when you accept him, you're not just trying to avoid hell. You're saying, God, I want you as my God. Jesus, I want you as my Lord. Not just to attend church on Sunday and hope to escape hell or to hopefully get heaven, but I want you every single moment of my life because I know what you did for me. Belief? That's wonderful. Confession of your faith, not being ashamed. I hope you're not ashamed. Tell people about your story. Repentance? When you see something that causes God grief and pushes God away from you, or rather pushes you away from him, I would hope you'd be sad and want to change that. Choosing to follow him by being baptized, I hope you'd want to do that. That's not much of a work when you consider going up a hill with a cross on your back after being scourged violently. We're not talking about steps to be saved. We're talking about following him, loving him. Because not only is Jesus God, he wants to be our God. Which will you choose? As we have the praise team come up, and as we have our invitation time, I want to encourage you that if there's anything getting in the way of Jesus becoming your God, the one that you want to follow 24-7, please come forward. Talk to me here. Talk to me afterwards. But don't let a moment go by. Let's stand as we have our invitation song.
uh, Sunday evening services tonight at 630 here at the church. Please come on out with us. Uh, Wednesday night Bible study, 6.30 p.m. Uh, we're still in Galatians, uh, so uh, that's Wednesday night, 6.30. Uh, church cleaning this week um, is Cassie in the auditorium, and classrooms Kathy and Lisa. Uh, food pantry, that would be this Thursday at uh, 6 to 7.30. Uh, social media outreach, uh, please do your part and watch, like, comment, and share uh, those posts on Instagram and Facebook pages. Um, any additional announcements? Yeah. All right. If there are no others, uh, we will close with a word of prayer. Uh, dear Heavenly Father, thank you that we can come here once again and learn more about you, and uh, thank you that we can uh, learn more about you, and we hope that the songs that we have sung and the message that we heard was uh, praise and honor and glory to you. It's in your name we pray. Amen.